The Island of Dr. Maru by H. G. Wells Introduction On February the first, eighteen eighty seven, the Lady Vane was lost by c- collision with a derelict when about the about the latitude one degree south for longitude one oh seven west on january the fifth, eighteen eighty eight. That is eleven months and four days after my uncle Edward Pedrick, a private gentleman, who certainly went aboard the Lady Vane of Cagolo, had been considered drowned, was picked up in latitude five degrees three south and longitude to one oh one west, in a small open boat of which the name was illegible, but which is supposed had been belonged to the missing schooner Ipechalilia. He gave such a strange account of himself, he supposed demented. Subsequently, he alleged that his mind was blank for the moment of his escape from Lady Vane. His case was discussed among psychologists at times as a curious incident, a lapse of memory constant upon physical and mental stress. The following narrative was found among his papers by undersigned his nephew and heir, but uncompromised by any definite request for publication. The only known, the only known, the only island known to exist in the region in which my uncle was picked up is Noel's Island, a small volcanic inlet and uninhabited. It was visited in 1891 by HMS Scorpion. A party of sailors, sailors had landed, found nothing living thereon except certain curious little white moths, some hogs and rabbits, and some rather peculiar rats. That this narrative is without confirmation is the most essentially particular with the understood with that understood there seems no harm in putting this strange story before the public in accordance as i believe my uncle's intentions yes at least as much as in its belief behalf accordance as i believe with my uncle's intentions this at least this much in its behalf, my uncle passed out of human knowledge with about latitude five south, reach south and longitude, one of five east. He appeared in the same part of the ocean after a space of eleven months. In the same way, he must have lived during an interval. It seems that a schooner called the Impecura, a drunken captain, John Davis, did start from Africa with a puma and certain other animals aboard in January 1887. Vissel was well known in several ports in the South Pacific. And it finally disappeared from the seas, those seas, considerable amount of copia aboard, saying its unknown fate by Vita in the December 1887, a date that tallies entirely in my uncle's story. Charles Edward Pedrick. The Isle of Dr. Moreau. A story written by Edric Pedrick Dick. Chapter 1. In the Dinghy of the Lady Vane. I do not propose to add anything to that has already been written concerning the loss of Lady Vane. As everybody knows, she collided with a derelict when ten days out of Cal- from Calio. The longboat with seven of the crew was picked up eighteen days later by the H.M. gunboat, Myrtle. Sorry, their terrible privations prov- prov- become quite as well known as more, far more than the horrible Medusa case by a I have to add to the published story the Lady Vane another, possibly as horrible and far stranger. Here it had been not supposed that the four men were in a dinghy perished, but this is incorrect. I had the best of evidence for this assertion. I was one of the four men. But in the first place I must state there was never was four men in the dinghy. The number was three. Constance, who was seen by the captain to jump into the gig, Lucky for us, was lucky for himself, did not reach us. He came down at a tangle, ropes under the strays of the smashed bowsprit. Some small rope caught his heel as he let go. He hung for a moment, then head downward, and then fell and struck a block of spar floating in the water. He pulled himself, pulled, to him, pulled towards him. He never came back up. Day news, March 17th, 1887. And lucky for us, it did not reach us. Lucky for us, he did not reach us. I must certainly say lucky for himself. We had 
only a small beaker of water and some sodden ship's biscuits with us. So sudden, a bit alarmed, so unprepared for the ship for any disaster. You thought the people on the launch would be better provisioned, though it seems they were not. We were tired to haul them. They could not have heard us. Next morning, when the drizzle cleared, which was not until the middle past midday, we could see nothing of them. We could not stand up to look about us because of the pitching of the boat. Two of men who escaped so far with me were a man named Helmut, a passionate like myself, and a seaman whose name I don't know, a short, sturdy man with a stammer. We drifted, drifted famishing. Now, after our water had come to an end, tormented and terrible first for eight days altogether. After the second day, the sea subdued slowly to a glassy glim calm. It's quite impossible for the ordinary reader to imagine as eight days. He was not luckily for himself anything in his memory to imagine with. After the first day, we did little to one another. We did said little to the one another, lay in our places, the boat and stared at the horizon, and watched with eyes grew larger and more haggard every day, and misery and weakness gaining upon our companions. Some became pitiless. The water that ended on the fourth day. We were already thinking strange things and saying them with our eyes, but it was it, it, it was, I think, the sixth for Herman gave voice to the things. We had all been thinking. I remember that our words were dry and thin. We were, so that we bent towards one another and spared our words. I stood out and meant against it with all my might. I was rather scuttling the boat and perishing together among the sharks that propelled us. But when Homan said that if his proposal accepted, we should have drink, the sailor came round to, to him. I could not draw, I would not draw lots, however. And in the night, the sailor whispered to Herman again. Again, I sat in the bows with my glass knife, my hand, and then, oh, I doubt it, but it's stuff in me to fight. In the morning, I agreed to Herman's proposal. He lay in the found the old man, old ma- the old man. A lot fell upon the sailor. He was the strongest of all of us. I would not abide by it. I attacked Herman with his hands. They gabbled together and almost stood up. I called along the boat to them, intending to help Herman fall by grasping the sailor's leg. But the sailor stumbled on the sway in the boat. The two fell upon the grill gunwale and rolled overboard together. They sank like stones. I remember laughing at that. I were only why I laughed. The laugh caught me suddenly, like a thing from about. I lay across one of the forwards for what I knew not how long, thinking of what for, if I had strength I could would I would drink seawater and madden myself to die quickly. And even if I lay there, I saw with no interest. Then, if I had been a picture, a sail came up towards me over the skyline. My mind must have been wandering, and yet I remember all this, uh, that happened quite distinctly. I remember how my head swayed with the seas. A horizon with a sail above it danced up and down. I also remember distinctly that I had pers- I had persuasion that I had, that I was dead. I ought thought what a jest it was that they should come too late to such a little to catch me in my body. By endless period it seemed as it seemed to me, I lay with my head on the forewalt, watching the schooner. She was a little ship, schooner rigged fore and aft. Come out of the sea, she kept tackling to and fro the winding compass, for she was sailing dead into the wind. Never entered my head to attempt to attract attention. I did not remember anything distinctly after the sight of her side, until I found myself in a little cabin at F. It is a dim half-memory of being lifted up uh, to the gangway, a big rounded countenance covered with freckles and surrounded with red hair staring at me over the bulk of the woods. I also had a disconnected impression of dark face, strawny eyes close to being. Mine, but I thought was a nightmare. Until I met it again, I fancy I collected some stuff being poured in me to me between my teeth, and that is all. Chapter Two A Man Who's Going Nowhere. The cabin in which I found myself was small and rather untidy. A young man with flaxen hair and brushly straw-coloured moustache and dropping neither lip. 
was sitting and holding my wrist. For a minute we stared at each other without speaking. He had watery grey eyes, oddly void of expression. Then just overhead came a sound from like an iron up bedstead being knocked about. Low, angry growling of some large animal. At the same time the man spoke, he repeated his question. How do you feel now? I felt, I think I said, I felt all right. I could not recollect how I got there. You must have seen the question in my face, for my voice was accessible to me. You were picked up in a boat, starving. The name of the boat was the Lady of Ain. There were spots of blood on the Colwell. At the same time, my eye caught my hand, so thin it looked like a dirty skin purse full of loose bones. All the business of the boat came back to me. Have some of this, he said, and gave me a dose of some scarlet stuff, iced. Tastes like blood and might made me feel stronger. You were in luck, said he, to get picked up by a ship with a medicine man aboard, medical man aboard. He spoke with sobering and architecturation, a ghost of a lisp. What ship is this? I said slowly, hoarse for my long silence. It's a little trader from Africa and the Calio. I never asked where she came from. In the beginning, about out of the land of bone falls. I guess I'm a passion myself from Africa. I said he asked who owns her. A uh, captain, too, named Davis. He lost his certificate or something. You know, the kind of man calls his thing the Capilla, or all the silly infernal names. Though, when there's so much of a sea without any wind, she only acts accordingly. She only acts accordingly. And the noise overhead began. Again, in a stunning ground, a voice of a human being together. Then another voice, telling him some forsaken idiot to detest. You were nearly dead, said in Luther. It is a very near thing, indeed. I put some stuff into you now. Notice your arms, the sore injections. We've been insensible for nearly thirty hours. I fought slowly, I was distracted now by the yelping of a number of dogs. Are you eligible for solid food? I asked. Thanks to me, he said. Now, even now, the mutton is boiling. Yes, I said of assurance, I could eat some mutton. But, he said with memory of very hesitation, You know, I'm dying to hear how you came to be alone in that belt. Damn that howling, I thought I detected a certain suspicion in his eyes. He suddenly left the cabin. I heard him in a violent controversy. as someone who seemed to me to talk gibberish in response to him. The matter sounded as though I ended in blows, but in that I thought my ears were mistaken. He shouted at the dogs and returned to the cabin. Well, said he, in the way. Well, were you just beginning to tell me I told him my name was Edward Pedrick. Nick. And now how I was taken to the Royal National History is a relief for the dullness of my comfortable independence. He seemed interested in this. i done some science myself. I did my biology at University College. Getting out the getting out the ovary of the earthworm, a radia, or the snail, all that, Lord, it's ten years ago. But go on, go on, tell me about the boat. He was eventually, eventually satisfied with the frankness of my story, which I told in con contois sentence. No, for though I felt horribly weak, when it was when it finished, he reverted to what once the topic of national history is in, uh, in his own biological studies. He began to question me closely about Tottenham Clo Road, Gower Street. Is Capadizia still flowing? What well, a shock that was. He's eventually been a very ordinary medical student and drifted incontinently into the topic of medical halls. He told me some antidotes. Left it all, he said, ten years ago. How jolly it all used to be. But I made a young ass myself. Play, my, play myself out before I was 21. I'd say it's all different now. But I must look up that ass of a cook and see what he's done with the, your mutton. The growing, growling overhead was renewed. So, sodded, so suddenly, there's so much savage anger that he startled me. What's that? I called after him. The door was closed. He came back again. The boiled mutton. I was so excited by the appetizing smell that I forgot the noise of the beasts that had troubled me. After a day of attentive sleep and feeding, I was far, so far recovered to be able to get from my bunk to the scuttle and see the green seas trying to keep pace with us. I judged the schooner was running before 
the wind, Montgomery, Montgomery, that was the name of the flaxen-haired man, came in again as I stood there. I asked him for some clothes. He let me some duck things of his own. But those I'd worn in the boat had been thrown overboard. They were rather loose for me, for he was large and long in his limbs. He told me casually that the captain was three parts drunk in his own cabin. I sure assumed the clothes. Again, to asking him some questions about the dear t- destination of the ship. He said the ship was bound for Hawaii, to Hawaii. But that he had to land him first. Why, I said. It's an island where I live. So far as I know, it hasn't got a name. He stared at me with neither lip dropping. He looked so wifly stupid of a, su- all of a sudden. It came to my head. He desired to avoid any questions. I had discretion to ask no more. Chapter 3 The Strange Face He left the cabin and found a man, a companion, but screwing away. He was staying on the ladder with his back to us, peering over the combing of the, hatch, of the hatchway. He was, I could see, a misshapen man, short, broad, and clumsy, with crooked back, hairy neck, and head shrunk between his shoulders. He was dressed in a dark blue suge, particularly thick, coarse black hair. Heard the unseen dogs growl furiously and within for if he ducked back, came into contact with the hand I put out to fend him off with my from myself. He turned with animal swiftness. In some indefinable way the black face thus flashed upon me shocked me profoundly. It was a singularly deformed one. The figure visual part was projected, forming something dimly suggestive of a nozzle. Huge of my half of a mouth showed as big white teeth as I've ever seen in a human mouth. His eyes were bloodshot as edges with scarcely a rim of white around the hazel pupils. There's a glorious glow of excitement in his face. Confound you, he said, not very, very. Why the devil didn't you get out of the way? Did you get out of the way? Lat faced man started out, started aside. Without a word, I went up to. Well, I went on up to the companion, staring at him distinctly. As I did so, Montgomery stared, stayed on, at the foot of for a moment. You have no business here, you know, he said, in a different tone, deliberate tone. Your place is forward. The black man cowered. Why, they don't give me, they don't want, they know that. They won't have me forward, he spoke slowly, with a hoarse, queer, hoarse quality to his voice. Why, won't you... Don't you have you forward? said Montgomery in a menacing voice. Well, I told you got to go. He was on the brink of saying something further. They looked up at me suddenly and followed me up the ladder. I paused halfway through the hatchway, looking back, all astonished, still astonished beyond measure, the grotesque ugliness of this black faced creature. I never beheld such a repulsive and extraordinary face before, and yet its contradiction is incredible. I experienced at the same time an odd feeling that in some way I had already encountered as exactly the features and gestures that now amazed me. Afterwards it occurred to me that probably I seen him as I was lifted aboard, and yet this scarcely sat on my suspicion of a previous acquaintance. Yet how one could set eyes on such a singular face and yet have forgotten the precise occasion past my imagination? Montgomery's movement to follow me released my attention. I turned and looked about me, the flush deck of a little schooner. Already half prepared by the sounds I'd heard from what I saw, certainly never beheld a deck so dirty, it littered with scraps of carrot, shreds of green stuff, its describable filth. Fastened by chains to the mace masts were a number of grisly staghounds, who now began leaping and barking at me by the mizzen of a huge puma that was cramped in a little iron cage far too small to give it turning room. Further under the starboard boat walk were a number of big hatches containing a number of rabbits. A single llama was squeezed in a mere box of a ca- a cage. Squeezed in a mere box of cage forward, the dogs were muzzled. By life of straps, the only human being on deck was gaunt and silent sailor at the wheel.
a parched and dainty, dirty spankers were tents for the wind, and up aloft the little ship seemed carrying every wind sail she had. The sky was clear and the sun midway through. The western sky, long waves capped by the breeze of the fort, with the froth of running with us, we went past the steersman to the taffrail, saw the water come foaming under the stern, and the bubbles go dancing and vanishing in a wake. I turned to the survey down the very length of the ship. Is this an ocean mirage? said I. Looks like it, said Montgomery. What are those beasts for? Merchandise curios? Does the captain think? You're going to sell them somewhere in the South Seas? It looks like it, doesn't it, Montgomery? Uh, said Montgomery, and turned towards the wake ahead. Suddenly we heard a yelp from volley of the furious blasphemy companion hatchway. The tall man with a black face came up hurriedly. He was immediately followed by a red-haired man, heavy-head red man in white cap, a sight of his form, former the stackhands who were tired of barking at him at all that by this time came furiously excited, howling, leaping against their chains. The black hesitated before them and gave the red-haired man time to come up with him and delivered a tremendous blow between the shoulder blades. The poor devil went down like a felled ox and rolled in the dirt among the furious, excited dogs. It was lucky for him they were muzzled. The red-haired man gave a yelp of its desolation and stood staggering as if he seemed to me in serious danger of having either going backwards down the companion hatch or forwards upon to move upon his victim. As soon as the second man has appeared and Montgomery started forward, steady on there, he cried in a tone of reminiscence. A couple of sailors appeared on the forecastle. The black-faced men howling, singular voice rolled about under the feet of the dogs. No one attempted to help him. The brutes did their best to worry him, butting their nozzles at him. It was a quiet dance of the leave. Grey figured bodies under over the gris, clumsy prostrate figure. The sailors, sailors forward shouted as though it was a marble sport. Montgomery gave an angry exclamation, went straddling, striding down the deck, and followed. I followed him. The black-faced man stumbled up and staggered forward, going and leaning over the bulwark by the main shrouds where he remained panting and glaring over his shoulder at the dog's red-haired man, laughed and a satisfied laugh. Look here, Captain, said Montgomery, with lips and little saturated, gripping the elbows of red-haired man. This won't do. I stopped behind Montgomery. The captain came half round, regarded him with the dull, solemn eyes of a drunken man. Whoa, well, what's he do? He said, added, after looking sleepily into Montgomery's face, a minute blasted sore bones. With a sudden movement, he shook his arm free, and after two infectious attempts, struck his flesh, pickled fists into his side pockets. That man's a passenger, said Montgomery. I advise you to keep your hands off him. Go to hell, said the captain only. He suddenly turned and staggered the walls aside. Do not do... What I like on my own ship, he said. I think Montgomery might have left him then, seeing the brute were drunk. But then he turned to say pallor and followed the captain to the bulwarks. Look here, captain. He said, that man in mine is not mine at all to be treated. He'd been hazed ever since he'd come aboard. For a moment, a minute, the alcoholic fumes kept the captain speechless. Blasted saw bones as all the considered, what was all he considered necessary. You could see that Montgomery had one of those slow, protectorous tempers as were warm, warm day after day to white heat and never again called to forgiveness. I saw too that this crawl had, had been going some, had some time growing. A man's a drunk, said I, perhaps officially. You do no good. Montgomery gave an awkward twist to his dropping tip lip. He's always drunk. Do you think that excuses insulting the passengers? My ship, began the captain, waving his hand as the stolly towards the cages. Was a clean ship. Look at it now. It's certainly anything but that. Clean. Crew, continued to the captain. the captain. Clean. Clean, respectful clue. You have agreed to take the beasts. I wish I never set my eyes on your fernal island. What the devil? What beasts for, for what on an island like that? Then the man of yours understand he was a man, he's a lunatic. He has no business of aft. 
Do you think the whole damn ship belongs to you? Your sailors begin to haze the poor devil as soon as he came aboard. After that, what he... That's just what he... He's a devil, an ugly devil. My men can't stand him. I can't stand him. And none of us can stand him. Nor you either. I can't be turned away. You leave that man alone anyhow, he said, nodding his head. He spoke. The captain meant to quarrel now. He raised his voice. If he goes on this end of the ship again, I'll cut his insides out. I'll tell you, cut it out his blasted insides. Who are you to tell me what I am to do? I tell you, I'm captain of the ship. Captain and owner. I am the law here. I tell you. The law and the prophets have begun to bargain to take a man with his attendant to and from Africa and being, bring back some animals. I never bargained to carry a mad devil and his silly sawbones. Oh, never mind what he called Montgomery. I saw the latter take a step forward and imposed. He's drunk, said I. The captain began some abuse, even fouler than the last. Shut up, I said, turning up, turning on him sharply. If I had been, had seen danger Montgomery's white face. With, with that, I brought the damn pond on myself. However, I was glad to avert what was uncommonly near a scuffle. Even at the price of the captain's drunk on your will, I do not think I could even heard, ever heard quite such foul, foul language come in continuous stream from any man's lips before. Though I have frequented his trenchant company enough, I found some of it hard to endure, though I am a mild man and man, but suddenly, when I am told the captain shut up, I forget and forgotten. I was merely a bit of human footsome, cut off from my resources with my fair unpaid, a mere casual dependent on the bounty of a speculative enterprise of the, sh- of the ship. He reminded me of it of it with a constant, considerable vigour, but at any, at any rate, I prevented a fight. Chapter 4 At the Schooner's Rail the night land was sighted after sundown. The schooner hove to Montgomery and imitated that it was his destination. It was too far to see any details. It seemed to me that simply a long, low, lying patch of dim hue, uncertain blue grey sky. Almost vertical streak of smoke went up from into the, from it into the sky. Captain was not on deck when it sighted. After he's vented his wrath from me, he staggered below and I understand he went to sleep on the floor of his own cabin. A mate practically assumed the command. He was gaunt and turned in his We had never seen at the will. Apparently, it was an evil temple with Montgomery. He took out the decisive notice of neither of us. He dined with him in sulky page silence after a few ineffectual efforts on my part to talk. It struck to me, too, that the men regarded my companion and his animals in a singularly unfriendly manner. I found Montgomery very resistant with his purpose on these creatures about his destination. I thought I was sensible to growing curiosity as, bo- as to, to both. I did not press him. He remained talking on the quarter deck until the sky was thick with stars, set for an occasional sound of yellow lint forecastle in a mo- moment of the animal movement. A movement of the animals now and then, when the light was very, st- the night was very still. Puma lay crouched together, watching us with shiny eyes. A black heap in the corner of the cage. Montgomery produced some cigars. He talked to me of London in a tone of half painful reminiscence, asking all kinds of questions about changes and had taken place. He spoke like a man who loved his life there, had been suddenly and irrevocably cut off from it. I got it as well. I could as well as I could of this and that. All the time the strangeness in him was shaping itself in my mind. As they talked, I peered at his odd, pallid face in the dim light of the burnical lantern landed behind him. Then I looked out in the dark green green sea, and where in the dimness of his little island was hidden. A man, it seemed to me, had come out of immensity, me, immensity merely to save my life. Tomorrow he would drop down over the side and vanished again out of my existence. Even 
Had it been under the common place circumstances? It would have made me a trifle thoughtful, but in the first place there was a singularly an educated man living on his unknown little island, covered with the strongly nature of his knowledge luggage. I found myself repeating the captain's question. What did he want with the beast? Why, too, had he repented, pretended not his, not his, when he remarked upon them at first? Then again, his personal attendant was that to be of bizarre quality, oppressed me profoundly. His circumstances threw a haze of mystery around the man. I laid hold of my imagination and tampered my tongue. I hammered my tongue. Towards midnight, our talk of London died to way we walked well side. We stood side by side, leaning over the bulk walks and staring dreamily over the silent scarlet, starlit, starlit sigh. Pursuing his own thoughts, it was uh, was the atmosphere of a sentiment. Again, upon my gratitude, if I may say it, said I, after a time, you have been, you have saved my life. Chance, he answered, just chance. I prefer to make it my thanks, a successful agent. Thanks, no one. You had no I had need, and I had knowledge, and I injected and fed you as much as I might have, collected the specimen. I was bored and wanted something to do. I'd been jaded that day. I wouldn't have liked your face. Well, it's a curious question. Well, you would, why would you, would you have been? He dampened my mood a little. At any rate, I begin. It's a chance I tell you, you interrupted. Everything is in man's life. Only the asses. Asses won't let me see it. Why am I? Why am I here now as an outcast from civilization, instead of being a happy man enjoying all the pleasures of London? Simply because eleven years ago I lost my head for ten minutes on a foggy night. He stopped, yes, and I said, I, that's all, we lapse into silence. But presently he laughed. There's something in his starlight that looses one's tongue. I'm an ass, and yet somehow I would rather, would like to tell you. Whatever you tell me, you may rely upon my keeping it to myself, if that's it. He was on the point of beginning, and then he shook his head doubtfully. Don't, said I. It is not, it is all the same to me, after all. It's better to keep your, your secret. There's nothing gained but a little relief. If I respect your confidence, if I don't. Well, he grunted and stridely. I felt I had him at a disadvantage, had caught him in a mood of distraction. And tell the truth, I was not curious to learn what might have driven a medical student out of London. I had given him an imagination, I shrugged my shoulders and turned him away. I was a terrible if learned a silent black figure watching the stars. Montgomery's strange attendant. He looked over its shoulder quickly with my movement, then looked away, looked away again. It may seem a little thing to you, perhaps, but it came like a sudden blow to me. The old, old little light near, the only light near us was a lantern of the wheel. The creature's face had turned one brief instant out of the darkness of the stern towards an illumination. I saw the, what the eyes had glanced at me shone with a pale green light. I did not know what the, that had reddish limousy, at least is not, not uncommon in human eyes. The thing came to me in stark humility. A black figure was its eyes as fire struck down for all my adult thoughts and feelings and for a moment the forgotten horrors of childhood came back to my mind. Then an effort passed, effect passed as I could come, uncouth black figure of a man, a figure, no particular impulse, hang over the peripheral. Against the starlight, I have found Montgomery was speaking to me. I'm thinking of turning it in, then, said I, he, if you had enough of this. I answered him incredulously. He went below, we went below and wished me a good night at the door of my, ca- my cabin. That night, I had some very unpleasant dreams. A waning moon rose late. Its light struck a ghostly white beam over my cabin and make an anonymous shape in the planking bottom of my bunk. Then the staghounds awoke began howling and baying, so that I jumped fitfully and scarcely slept until the approach of dawn.